Hello, everybody. How's it going? Adjust this. It's not covering my mouth in the frame. How's everybody doing? It's been a long time since I've done a live stream. Anyone in the chat right now, uh, let me know if there's any problems with the audio or can you hear me? Does it sound good? Does it sound like the podcast? Okay, no, nothing from the chat. I'm just going to trust that the audio is working because, uh, you know, you got to you gotta trust. Oh, there we go. Stockpile Thomas says it sounds fine. Maybe there's just a little delay on the chat. So, um, yeah, I recently published that video, Weakness Corrupts, which if you read in the description, that's an adaptation of an article that I wrote originally on Medium a long time ago before the podcast existed. And, you know, at, at the time, it didn't seem like very controversial. I, I mean, like there was a, a publication called Socrates Cafe that seemed like a very just middle of the road uh, philosophy publication on Medium that uh, put it up there. And I realized that they went with the subtitle, Resentiment is identified as a psychological poison. And in that video, Weakness Corrupts, um, a lot of people took what I was saying about power in an explicitly political sense. And I think it's really important to understand the point that's being made in that video begins psychologically. And I, there were a couple of comments that said, you know, when Nietzsche is talking about will to power, he doesn't mean political power. He doesn't mean power over others. Uh, I think... It's very hard for me to take that seriously, having comprehensively read all of Nietzsche's work, that that isn't included in Nietzsche's definition of power. Nietzsche is not just talking about that. It's not a vulgar definition of power, but it's certainly included. It's very hard to read genealogy of morality and the descriptions that Nietzsche gives of like ruling classes of warrior barbarians or fighting aristocracies and think that he's not talking about something that's nested in a political reality. Anyway, the point being, any relationship or situation where you one person has power or one group has power and another group does not, it doesn't have to be a state. It doesn't have to be political. It could be, let's get Marxian for a second. It could be your employer, your boss has power over you. Or let's say it's in a relationship where maybe one partner has more power than the other partner has, like financially or something like that, where one person's dependent on someone else, right? Now, is it necessarily the case? This is actually, I think that's a good example I've stumbled on. Is it necessarily the case if one partner technically has more power in a marriage because they have more financial power, they're more self-sufficient and stable, and the other person is maybe dependent on them for an income or standard of living, is it necessarily the case that the the quote unquote more powerful or more self-sufficient member of that marriage or relationship is going to be corrupted by that power? You say no, well, because they love they love them, right? In a healthy marriage or a healthy relationship, you're in it because you love the other person. So uh, you wouldn't expect to see that sort of like corrupting influence of power. The kinds of people who uh, want to hurt or be cruel to their romantic partner, though. Where does that come from? Does that come from the fact of them? See, it's complicated because like in abusive relationships, I guess people will set up situations where they have power over the other person. But I guess what I'm saying is like power in the broadest possible sense, power over your own life, right? The kind of person that wants to use that to hurt someone else or be cruel to someone else. What does modern psychology tell us about that kind of person? It's almost always because they've been hurt themselves. And then they want to then take that out or deal with their issues in that way by, um, you know, lording it over someone else or making life, you know, hard or cruel or painful for someone else. And so I think that reveals the weakness corrupts idea very clearly. If you look at it on like the level of a relationship, it's not like if one partner is more financially independent and self-sufficient and technically has more power where the other one may, might be dependent on them, that could still be a perfectly functional, like happy relationship. It's when one person has been uh, damaged in some way and they want to take it out on someone else. And so like, likewise, 
with this could be true in a political sense. It could be true in an economic sense. It could be true on any level of human relationship. It's not simply holding power that makes you want to be cruel to people or malicious or malevolent. That's not what we see in history. Um, and on the level of the political, see, really what, it, what we're getting at, why it applies to the political is because anytime you're in a situation where some sort of harm comes to you and you're not able to retaliate or protect yourself against it, that creates resentment in Nietzsche's view, or it has the potential to create resentment, especially if we bring in like a Deleuzian view, Deleuze would uh, really emphasize uh, the deficiency is ultimately in you, whether you become resentful or not. It doesn't require any sort of like past trauma or hurt to come to you, but it's the fact that you're unable to, you become able, unable to forget because you're unable to sort of discharge whatever negativity you experience um, either by retaliating or like defending yourself against it in any way you experience that helplessness. That is then what creates malevolence, cruelty, the desire to hurt people, like leaving morality entirely out of it. Just talking strictly psychologically, whether you want to moralize about it or not, it creates that desire to hurt just for the sake of hurting, um, or taking a revenge or an imaginary revenge or something of that nature. That's the whole point of the weakness corrupts uh, video. And so why am I starting out talking about this? Well, I got a lot of like comments. So there was, there were those people who said, oh, you were talking about it in this like political way, which it's not. And it's, it is political. The political is included. It's not the totality of it. It's, it's a psychological reality though, about any situation where there's like a power imbalance, it has the potential to create result. And I think that I don't see how you can read genealogy of morality any other way personally. Like I, I, I think the, even Deleuze's reading, which is far more subtle and nuanced and, and some of the things that he brings out than the, the average reading that you hear, you still have that, um, the fundamental understanding of active and reactive maybe rather than strong or weak. And the point is still the same. And this is the way I would answer some people who would, who had brought up, well, there were plenty of people who hold power who are corrupt. How can you deny that? It's like not denying that the entire point is that you can become powerful and still be a reactive person. You can be corrupted by weakness and then find your way into power. And that doesn't mean that you stop. You, you no longer internalize that resentful mode of being that of engaging with the world. You can still be resentful and uh, slavish in Nietzsche's terminology and find your way into power. I mean, one guy, so I picked out a couple of comments. One guy said, so true, the most powerful people on the planet would never retreat to a secret island to abuse the weak. And I'm like, okay, well, the people that you're talking about, like the, Nietzsche's not talking about them or as an example of like the master morality. Like when Nietzsche is talking about the master morality, like people really need to understand this is like a historically nested thing. And you could even argue from like, again, a Deleuzian standpoint, that might not even have been a thing that actually existed, that it is Nietzsche's sort of historical myth or psychological myth in the same way Hegel's master slave dialectic is a kind of psychological myth. That what Nietzsche is really describing as somebody who's totally in the master morality would be somebody who is completely active and therefore not resentful or guilty or any bad conscience at all. And you could make a serious case that no human like that has ever existed. That that is, if you're describing somebody who's completely free of resentment and the bad conscience, you're describing the overman at that point. You're describing something that would just beyond the human because the human existence has been defined by those things. I'm not saying you have to buy that argument, but I think there is a good case for it, especially when Nietzsche in Thus Book Zarathustra says he's looked to the highest man and the lowest man. He found them all human, all too human. Nobody has yet fully overcome these things. And so, but the point is like, and this is really what I, I, I want to drill down on. So yeah, like modern corrupt people who do like fucked up things, um, and act in a parasitical fashion um, or are abusive or want to cause harm, um, 
the claim is that is not that no powerful person has ever acted that way. That would be ridiculous. The claim is that the point is not that that power makes you good. The point is that the English moralist claim that power makes you bad is not correct. And that kind of idea is promoted um, as a way to make you fear taking power. Like you ever think about that? It's like the people who promote that idea are themselves slave moralists who have found their way into power and uh, want to tell you that it's too dangerous for you to have it. I mean, that's, that's really the message here is like anything you want to accomplish at all will require power. Like power is that here I'm using Paul Katsafanis' language uh, of Nietzschean constitutivism. Power is a constitutive element of every human action. So if you have like some problem with something that you want to change, you're going to need power to change it. It's this is basic stuff, right? So if you're concerned with like the injustice of the world or whatever, then you're going to need power to address that. And if you're constantly afraid of becoming too powerful, that's paralyzing, right? And, and so the whole idea, like Nietzsche's psychological accounting of how people are damaged by being in a position of weakness and that we might even then also make the further nuance that maybe it's a psychological weakness from the very start within them because not everyone placed into such situations reacts in the same way or becomes reactive to the same extent. Um, those people, when, just by the fact that they find their way into some money or political power or whatever it is, that does not make them like noble exemplars of the master morality. That's just simply not the case. And I, I don't see any reading of history that could that could make that claim. And Nietzsche is certainly not making that claim. Now, and and I think it's clear throughout the video. He has like this admiration for people who are so powerful that they can be merciful and generous. And yet people still want to react to Nietzsche like he's just saying that the elites should be a bunch of psychopaths and do whatever they want. Okay, well, that you know, you didn't watch the video, you didn't understand the video. The the one criticism I got that was like it made me kind of stop and be like, okay, this is a bit more complicated maybe than I'm portraying it in that video. Somebody was like, well, what about Genghis Khan? <laughs> was Genghis Khan, you know, and it's like, yeah, it would be a little bit of a cop out to say Genghis Khan must have had his own psychological baggage. Somebody who hurt you, Genghis Khan, uh, you know, were you just lashing out? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's where you would kind of have to go back to the idea that, initially just because people were not actively trying to hurt and cause pain for the sake of doing it as a form of like taking revenge or, or causing cruelty um like true malevolence you know yeah in pre-modern times the way that people treated the out group was brutal and it's it's as brutal as we treat animals that we slaughter for our food um, you could argue more or less so, right? Um, but something else that we consider in the out group that's not part of our moral framework, right? I'm not comparing people groups to animals. I'm just saying the way that people think, right, morally has changed at, at various epochs. And yeah, like the way that people treated the out group, people like Genghis Khan, they conquered and marauded and killed and they didn't have a second thought about it. Um, but that's why, you know, Nietzsche wouldn't deny that that's the case. If anything, he emphasizes that. It's just that Genghis Khan also created the modern world. There's a great book called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. Who, the name of the author escapes me at the moment. Um, that, you know, aside from whatever moralizing analysis of history, which is always the least interesting thing about history, because what are we doing moralizing about it? You literally can't do anything about it. So the moralizing there's not much point to it. Um, but you know, I don't get the impression that Genghis Khan, I mean, maybe he did, he did have that quote saying like, it was like pleasure to hear the lamentation of your foes and you know, uh, all of that. So, you know, there is, there is complexity to, to this perspective, um, of Nietzsche's and that's why I typically do hour and a half long 
podcasts about it. And I typically don't do this like short form content that, um, you know, where everyone can say, well, like, what about this nuance or what about that? Um, you know, yeah, it's really hard to get these ideas across in like 12 minutes. I'm still probably going to keep trying, but, um, I just wanted to answer like that really basic thing of like, well, why are you just saying that people are in power are never corrupted by it or they're never corrupt people in power? No, that's not the point at all. The point is exactly the opposite. It's, it's just, it's that oftentimes people who find themselves in the halls of power are corrupt, but it's not the power that corrupted them. It's their own internalized weakness, their own resentment and bad conscience. Um, that's what makes people at least malicious, cruel, wanting to cause harm. Again, you can set aside the issue of like, might they cause harm to people for other reasons? Like just, they just don't care about like not causing harm. They have some grand, you know, like Dick Mars dictator, Elon Musk wants to build a space laser and, you know, a bunch of his unpaid slaves get, you know, worked to death in the mines to mine titanium and Pavanus Ma uh, Mons or whatever. But, you know, dictator Elon didn't want to kill those people. He's trying to build like a giant space laser. Um, right. Was that <laughs> so it's like and then that gets into like making moral judgments about that. And again, that's like I'm not interested in any of that. Um, I'm just saying it, it set all that aside. The basic psychological truth is that people, the people who want to hurt you, who actively hate and want to hurt people or groups of people are doing so because they're weak not because they're strong. Because so if they're strong, they wouldn't need to feel that way. They wouldn't be concerned. They wouldn't be in this reactive relationship with another person basing their, like, you know, their whole raison d'etre on, like, hurting someone else. Um, that's so juvenile and immature, and it's the, it's the self-destructive, unproductive cycle that has characterized a lot of mankind. Okay, so I, I guess that's enough for that topic for now. Um, I have a super chat. I wasn't expecting this. Um, I think this is the first super chat I've ever had. Um, so that's kind of cool. Thank you, Vegan Sports Bar. Sometimes I requite and choose not to retaliate, but other times I style and become resentful. Style. Um, okay, you become resentful, and I feel I should have responded violently. Why? Um, okay, there's so many ways to answer that. Uh, we could say that as a species, our capacity to forget has become maladapted and that you should have, uh, you know, if you were an animal, you would have just forgotten about it. You know, you would have, uh, Nietzsche talks about that passage in Human All to Human about the two types of revenge. The first type of revenge is like a self-defense mechanism, it's just like an immediate physiological fight or flight. Um, and it's the fight version, basically. Strike back at the thing that's attacking you. Uh, but we have consciousness, and because of that, we can retain traces of something that struck at us or hurt us or harmed us. And you can like hold on to that feeling that you're under attack or have been harmed in some way and still want to be striking back at them long after the danger is passed um, because you feel slighted or dishonored or insulted or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, that's why that happens. And the answer, I mean, Nietzsche's example is Mirabeau in, uh, genealogy, uh, that, uh, figure from the French revolution who Nietzsche says never had to forgive because he simply forgot his memory was so bad that he was the, the most magnanimous of all, uh, men because people could slight or insult him and, uh, he would just, uh, forget about it just rolled off his back. I actually see somebody in the chat saying Emerson, Mirabeau, Pascal, all noble and pow powerful souls for Nietzsche that never hurt anybody. I'm actually, the episode on Pascal is going to come out on Tuesday. If you're a patron, you'll get it. I think tomorrow, uh, Nietzsche and Pascal comparison, which I am very excited about. And <laughs> one of the best quotes from that, um, Dr. Michael Sugru, um, quotes, from this as well in Nietzsche's notes uh, in his lecture on Pascal. Uh, rest in peace, Dr. Sugru. Uh, he passed away recently. That was very sad. Um, but he, he quotes Nietzsche saying, Christianity can never be forgiven uh, for what it did to Pascal. <laughs> that the, the, the greatest crime of Christianity throughout the millennia can be summed up by what it did to Pascal. That we have to maintain a, a constant 
psychological, be on guard against uh, Christianity for that very reason, because it will ruin you the way that it ruined Pascal. Um, I just, I love Nietzsche in terms of phrase, turns of phrase like that, for example, where he's talking about, um, you know, uh, Christianity can never be forgiven when it's the religion. Oh, it's all about guilt and forgiveness. Christianity can never be forgiven when it's the religion. Oh, it's all about guilt and forgiveness, right? Um, so that's Christianity's guilt that it can never be forgiven for. It's unforgivable sin is what it did to poor Pascal. Uh, somebody's asking what happened to Pascal. Uh, he he just drove himself insane with his um, uh, Christian like inner torment over knowing that there was no way to rationally prove the faith, but believing that life was utterly meaningless and horrifying if God wasn't real and just spending his life arguing for why we should forsake reason and uh, cling to Christianity uh, because otherwise life is not worth living. And Nietzsche personally believed this is kind of dubious. Maybe it's true that the, the, the stress of like how, um, how like just the manic depressive state that Pascal was in, he probably was a manic depressive. Uh, the, that level of stress, like shortened his life. He died when he was like 39 years old and that, um, you know, he was always kind of a sickly person. People don't really know exactly why that is. Um, I've read one theory that it might have been from breathing in mercury fumes when he was doing his scientific research. Um, very unfortunate. Uh, episode on Spinoza is coming soon. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. The episode on Pascal actually already came out on the podcast feed. It's coming out on YouTube soon. So you can go listen to the Pascal episode on Spotify like right now. It's the Spinoza episode that's coming out next tuesday spinoza like may have because he was a lens grinder uh, probably breathed in a bunch of glass particulates and just lacerated himself very very slowly and and gradually and finally over many many years and that probably significantly shortened his life uh so it's it's funny you, you read about all these things nietzsche as well you know he has his congenital condition but also as I learned when I talked to my friend Andre, uh, the first podcast episode I did with him, when you look into Nietzsche's diet, he like ran Nietzsche's diet through, um, I think it's like the University of uh, Stanford's website on, uh, like, I, I don't know what the name of it is. Uh, it's like a dietary website where they break down, you put in like foods and it tells you like which vitamins and minerals and everything that you get like from each different item or whatever. He basically found out that when he punched in Nietzsche's diet, that he was like totally deficient on like vitamin C and like magnesium and potassium and all these things that like can really cause serious problems, uh, stomach problems, vision problems and headaches, like all of these things that Nietzsche suffered from. I think there was a pre-existing like congenital illness, like basis for all of these symptoms that he had. But what he found was that his diet almost certainly like made it much, much worse. So uh, my point in bringing all that up is like I keep reading about all these philosophers who did something like something in their lives, like breathing in mercury or glass particulates or like having a horrible diet that just like totally shortened their productive lives and um, totally fucked them over. And half the time they didn't even know it. <laughs> Most of the time they didn't even know it. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's kind of sad. It's kind of tragic, but it's interesting. These similarities too, that, you know, Spinoza, always a man of ill health, uh, Pascal, ill health, Nietzsche, ill health. It's funny. Another comment on the weakness corrupts video that somebody had was that Nietzsche, you know, he was sickly. He was a drug abuser. It's like, well, yeah, he took painkillers to deal with like the severe pain he was in from his condition. That is hypocritical given Nietzsche's philosophy, but I, I give him a pass on that. But yeah. Given Nietzsche's philosophy of, uh, you know, strength, life, health, and the fact that he was physiologically sickly, that's a very fascinating topic. It's a fascinating contradiction. I did, in fact, the last live stream I did, I talked about that extensively, so I won't talk about it much more here. But, you know, when somebody brings that up as an objection to Nietzsche, I'm like, okay, I mean, that's just an objection to philosophy. Let's be real. Most philosophers are sickly and have some sort of, 
you know, health problem, uh, you know, and so knock on wood, hopefully I don't die soon. Yeah, it's putting myself on a high pedestal. I, I consider myself more of a philologist than a philosopher. Um, maybe I'm a little of both, but like amateur philology is really what this channel is, right? So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, I wanted to talk about something uh, related to uh, postmodernism. Uh, and this was spurned by, I, I've watched a lot of interviews and lectures recently from Stephen Hicks. And Stephen Hicks, I, I cited his work um, in a couple past episodes um, regarding Nietzsche. I, I, I don't have anything against the man. I think he's mainly known for like criticizing postmodernism, to be honest. So I don't really know much of his work beyond that. But I just found, I had a familiar feeling when listening to his lectures, where he's saying all the th these things about postmodernism, that for one, the way he's describing postmodernism is incredibly similar to a lot of the points Nietzsche makes, but he's just sort of throwing them out there like, this is obviously bullshit, is the vibe, right? So, you know, uh, postmodernism is, you know, there is no truth. It's all just competing power groups struggling for advantage. Um, you know, it's a totally cynical outlook on the world in which, uh, you know, there is no, uh, he didn't use this, this terminology, but just to cut to the chase, like they use the Jordan Peterson terminology. There's no logos or like objective reality intersection of the subjective and objective of where our, subjective interpretation of the reality like the rubber meets the road and like we we come together over some common principle that is indisputable um you know the the, pro the big problem with postmodernism is that this doesn't exist for them and i hear all this and especially when it comes to people like jordan peterson who has been like so uh so outspoken about his love of nietzsche i, I brought this up before but he was like recently on Piers morgan's show and he said Here's Morgan is asking him like rapid fire questions. He's like, give me a one word answer. And he goes, what, what is the philosopher everyone should read? And without hesitating at all, Jordan Peterson says Nietzsche. <laughs> and I'm watching this thinking if they actually read Nietzsche, it's diametrically opposed to your entire worldview. It's, it is the postmodernism that you're raging against. And I know there might be some people who are going to take issue with me saying that, um, because they've associated postmodernism with like Marxism and leftism. And Nietzsche is not those. He is, you know, I just actually had a guest on uh, Devin Gore, who is the left Nietzschean. Um, I appreciate his perspective. I, I don't agree with him. Um, Nietzsche is not a leftist, he, but he, I think, can be accurately described as like a proto postmodernist. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at some quotes. Okay, this is from on truth and lies in the non-moral sense. Quote, what then is truth? A movable host of metaphors, metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been poetically and rhetorically intensified, transferred, and embellished, and which, after long usage, seem to a people to be fixed, canonical, and binding. Truths are illusions, excuse me, truths are illusions, which we have forgotten are illusions, they are metaphors that have become worn out and have been drained of sensuous force, coins which have lost their embossing and are now considered as metal and no longer as coins. Uh, let's look at a couple more. Beyond Good and Evil, this is in uh, Part 1, Section 4, quote, The falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it. It is here, perhaps, that our new language sounds most strangely. The question is how far an opinion is life furthering, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps species rearing. And we are fundamentally inclined to maintain that the falsest opinions to which the synthetic judgments a priori belong, we'll dig at Kant, are the most indispensable to us. That without a recognition of logical fictions, without a comparison of reality with a purely imagined world of the absolute and immutable, that a constant counterfeiting of the world by means of numbers, man could not live. 
that the renunciation of false opinions would be a renunciation of life, a negation of life, to recognize untruth as a condition of life. That is certainly to impugn the traditional ideas of value in a dangerous manner, and a philosophy which ventures to do so has thereby alone placed itself beyond good and evil. Okay, one end quote. One final quote, two aphorisms later. And I want to point out, Jordan Peterson has done a 45-minute analysis of this passage, just this one passage of, of Nietzsche's. And anyway, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, this is section six of that same chapter. Quote, it has gradually become clear to me what every great philosophy up till now has consisted of, namely the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. And moreover, that the moral or immoral purpose in every philosophy has constituted the true vital germ out of which the entire plant has always grown. Indeed, to understand how the abstrusest metaphysical assertions of a philosopher have been arrived at, it is always well and wise to first ask oneself, what morality do they or does he aim at? Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy, but that another impulse here as elsewhere has only made use of knowledge and mistaken knowledge as an instrument. End quote. So, okay. If you know what, let's, let's talk about what postmodernism is, right? So you have pre-modernism, uh, which is the period before the modern era, which a lot of people think modern means contemporary, but historically modernity begins in the 1500s, basically with the, the enlightenment. Um, and so the pre-modern era includes antiquity. It includes uh, the medieval period. And in the pre-modern era, uh, the, what would you say? Epistemology is basically has not been fully invented yet to the degree that, or in the sense that we would talk about epistemology now. So what do I mean by that? With figures like Descartes and others actually asking, how do we know what we know? Um, you have this transition to individual human reason uh, away from revelation. And that is the defining feature of modernity. It's the enlightenment, it's scientific revolutions, it's the faith in human reason. And then out of this becomes this belief in the individual and eventually liberalism. Post-modernity, um, you know, you can, you can kind of argue about where this begins, right? A lot of people say World War II, uh, maybe dropping the atom bombs. Um, and then of course, you know, you have like the Frankfurt school and, uh, critical theory and all these sort of post French postmodern philosophers. And I think, you know, it's not sufficiently talked about, but American pragmatists, uh, people like William James, uh, the analyt the whole analytical school of philosophy and the philosophy of Wit uh, Wittgenstein, excuse me. Uh, where all philosophical problems are basically said to be linguistic confusions, right? Uh, and it's this, it's basically the end of the project of etymology with the conclusion that no, we can't really know anything. That there is no, I, I like to use the term immaculate perception. You don't, there's no absolute perceiver. Um, all perception is relative. All perception, everyone has the sense that they have for the way things are based on who and what they are and their perspective, their place in uh, wherever they are in reality, basically their vantage point. Um, and it's that realization. And then the charges of, you know, people like Wittgenstein that all of these philosophical debates have simply been linguistic confusions or the pragmatic stance that we're just going to set these epistemological questions aside. We're going to table them and do what's practical. Uh, that sort of sets the stage for when you have these, you know, postmodernists like Derrida who will say that, you know, all that we have is a text, a narrative about reality, and there's no escaping this narrative creating impulse that human beings have. That our entire way of approaching re reality and understanding reality is to frame it within 
uh, place it within a certain frame, which is necessarily going to exclude other things or make certain things emphasized and other things unimportant. Um, and so this ends with the rejection of that faith in the individual human reason. Really, that's the main point. So pre-modernity is revelation. Uh, then you have the transition to enlightenment uh, reason. And then post-modernity is calling into question the entire project of enlightenment rationalism. And I wish that people would talk, maybe I'll just make this point. I wish people would talk less about postmodernism, which is like this ideology that's associated with all these thinkers and has all this baggage behind it. And like I said, is associated with Marxism and leftism. Instead, we should really be talking about postmodernity. Uh, the era that we're in is, is postmodernity. Because, I, you know, whenever people like Hicks raise these problems, like the postmodernists don't believe in objective absolute truth. My question is, okay, what is your basis for it? What, like, do you have some alternative? Do you, do you have access to the noumenal, noumenal reality? Have you received a revelation from, from God or from an angel that that's like given you certainty in your uh, judgments on the world? Because it, it seems to me that that's just the position that we're in. Like it's, it's just maturity to realize, yeah, okay. Absolute certainty, objective truth of a mind independent reality. That's a red herring. You can chase that your whole life and you're never going to find it. And that questions of values and the things that we really care about, um, you know, that you're not going to argue yourself into having a value that you do not hold, um, that that's going to be based again on who and what you are, what is to your advantage to believe and what comforts you. And people will nakedly make this argument. If we throw all this out, Look what will happen to our society. That's a postmodern perspective. We have to believe this, even though it's false, because as Nietzsche says, the falseness of a judgment is not an objection to a judgment. What if it's life preserving to hold that false judgment, these fictions? But if you read that and you think you're reading a modernist philosopher, to me, that's insane. Nietzsche is not a modernist in his conception of truth. He's just not. And you might agree or disagree. You definitely can. But, uh, you know, uh, so that would be, that's really just the first thing of my criticism of these people is that oftentimes I find them appropriating Nietzsche while they're on a total crusade against postmodernism, which is the epistemological stance that Nietzsche pioneers. He's like the first one to like really seriously raise these issues. And they, they just completely ignore that cognitive dissonance well, of course i do or it wouldn't be cognitive dissonance but just a couple things about postmodernism that and the way not really about postmodernism the way that postmodernism is discussed among i guess you might say conservative intellectuals or just people who are generally they made it their goal to make war on this idea um you know one of the things i heard stephen hicks say is he said, to combat this movement, we have to study and understand its intellectual roots. And there, there's fallacious thinking in that, for one, because, because his whole characterization of the postmodernists is that they don't want to, they're unwilling to debate and bring their ideas to the marketplace of ideas. They don't want to listen to reason. They don't think they're subject to reason, to objective standards of reason. Right, because their whole product project is critiquing rationality. Um, if you think that's the case, I think it's funny that you think you have to argue them out of that. <laughs> like, now I understand their goal is to save the neutrals, right? The people who are have no stance on on postmodernity uh, from falling into this like evil, destructive ideology. But I guess if what I'm trying to get at here, which un which is underlying all of this, it's like what you don't have faith in, in human reason. If this is so plainly incoherent, why does it have the power that it does? Like, if it's plainly incoherent to say that like human values are relative, and that there is no objective means of you know determining what we should value, for example, that's just one potential. Uh, proposition 
Um, if that's just an incoherent position, uh, then why? If you have faith in human reason, you should have faith that that's not going to take hold. Why? Why do plainly incoherent ideas such as postmodernism take hold then? And like, it seems very obvious to me that the marketplace of ideas has failed time and time again. And I don't see how anyone living in a democracy in 2024 can think that like human beings on mass will use reason to make decisions when it comes to the most important things in their lives, like how to run the, the polity that they're a part of. It's very obvious that, um, you know, again, like we were talking about earlier with, uh, me responding to some of the comments from, from weakness corrupts, you know, people act based on these psychological motivations, oftentimes that they're not even aware of. Um, they might be driven by resentment or bad conscience or the desire to hurt others. And that might not be rational at all. And they might not even know that they're doing it. So how are you going to like argue them out of it? Um, and I also, the, the other, I'm trying to get at this contradiction at the bottom of this. And I don't, I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of articulating it. I think, I think I've put my finger on it actually. It's like, they're saying, okay, for us to have this in group or for to have a functional society, we have to have this in group that all agrees on enlightenment values. And within that in group that agrees on enlightenment values, we can solve our problems by debate and the marketplace of ideas and not have to have violence and conflict within that in group. But <laughs> And so like the, the, the harms, the danger that they're trying to warn against is that if we don't all accept this idea, it's going to be war, right? Um, to, for lack of a better word, that open conflict is prevented by this discourse. But then it's like, what do you do with the people who don't agree with that central value? Do you have war on them? Right. And so it's like they still they end up recreating this postmodern world in which you have irreconcilable values that you can't discuss someone into like changing. And the only solution is to have war on them. They just take it up a level. Right. They just say like, well, like because that would be how they would feel like, again, like I really try to keep this channel non-political, But what I'm trying to do here is like analyze the thought process behind a lot of contemporary political ideologies not to take a stand on them or tell you how you should think, but just to like analyze the fallacious things about the way they think. Because a lot of the times, like on the right wing side of things, you hear like rhetoric about, for example, like when it comes to Islam, we don't have any shared values with us. They completely make these different valuations. We don't understand them. They don't understand us. Um, so the only language that they understand is like the use of force. And it's like you're just recreating that postmodern world of competing power groups that don't understand one another with irreconcilable differences. And I would argue, you know, what Nietzsche is actually drawing on to, to bring out a lot of that, I typically call it perspectivism and not postmodernism. But that comes out of like Thucydides, which is a pre modern perspective. Um, Thucydides in his history of the Peloponnesian War is not moralizing and saying, and the Athenians were right and the Spartans were wrong. He's saying they both pressed their claims. They both had completely irreconcilable irre um, understanding of uh, what the conflict was and who was in the right in that conflict. And because that was irreconcilable, they didn't, talking it over did not work. And the only thing to do at that point was to, to have a war. Uh, the whole Melian dialogue, right? Um, you can say that that's cynical and, and postmodern, but I would argue that many of the things that uh, people like Stephen Hicks characterize as the harms of adopting a postmodern perspective are actually there like in the Melian dialogue. Stephen Hicks needs to read the Melian dialogue. He has all these ideas about justice and enlightenment rationality. Did that help the millions? I, I mean, I don't know. The, the other thing, too, that's very interesting, this is probably going to be the last political comment I'll, uh, I'm going to make, and then I'll just go to answering questions or talking with the audience. Um, I remember seeing an interview with Ben Shapiro where he said he was talking about they were tearing down statues, right? Um, you know, uh, we remember there was like a big tear down statues fever that 
<laughs> swept over the nation and it started out with confederates but eventually they were like tearing down statues of like cervantes and stuff it just clearly don't even know who these people are they're just like they we're against statues they don't like marble or whatever um or the or bronze and so he was he was talking about ben shapiro was sort of saying why this was bad and he was saying you know you know the the left with their moral purity they think that anyone who doesn't have the values that we have here in 2020, um, you know, everyone, even people who lived 20 years ago, they were just evil because they don't measure up to their standard of morality they've come to in the modern age. I remember hearing that and I'm like, you're making a moral relativist argument. You're saying that we, we can't judge them because according to the standards of their time and place, they did the best that they could, or they had a just a different set of valuations and a different way of looking at the world, and they were not like you. And you can't judge them by a universalist objective moral standard, because that's exactly, you have to see, whether you agree with it or not, that is exactly what the left was doing when they're tearing down statues. Judging the past by an objective, absolute moral standard, which is the very thing that a lot of these critics of postmodernism say is exactly what we should all be doing. We should all be trying to come to agree to what is the objective universal moral standard. We should be a, be defending the reality of these concepts. But then when somebody else does it from an irreconcilable standpoint with them, they're very upset about it. And then they start making morally relativistic arguments while complaining on the other side of that coin about postmodernism, which should really, and this is the last point, that should really lead you to think, is the modern left actually postmodern? Modern left, the contemporary left, are they actually postmodern? I don't think that they are. If we're talking about these cultural left coalition, their viewpoint to me seems to be morally zealous, it seems to be universalist. It seems to be values that descend from liberalism and yes, Marxism. Marxism is part of liberalism. Marxism comes out of liberalism and the Enlightenment. Marxism is a Western cultural production. That's another thing. It's like people who like hate the West and they're Marxists. It's like the entire thing of being self-critical of your own civilization is a Western cultural export where that we're exporting to the rest of the world. Most other cultures are not self-critical in the way that like a Western Marxist would be. Um, so you should at least, you know, what is it? Nietzsche says he who despises himself still, um, still, what is the, the word he uses? It, obviously it's translated, but like still, uh, exalts himself as one who despises. You're still putting yourself in that position to, to judge and criticize your own culture, which is like, that's a uniquely enlightenment thing. Uh, maybe not uniquely, but it's, it's it's distinctively, it's definitively the Enlightenment, right? My individual human reason uh, can can go against the uh, the excesses and the the failures of my own society. Oh, and actually, one further point. Another thing I see um, that Stephen Hicks says a lot is that postmodernism is like the reduction of everything to collectivism and the destruction of individual identity in favor of a collective identity. For one, something, again, that these people never say, pre-modernism is collectivist, right? Um, it's not, this is not some new invention. If you go back to the Middle Ages, you are not an individual first. You are a member of a class first. You're a Christian first. Um, you're a ruler or a knight or a noble or a peasant um, and then your individuality and like you're, and then after that, you're a member of a family or an extended kin group or a guild. It's these associations and ties that bind, right? The average person in the middle ages is a bondsman. He is bonded to the land. He's linked together by the religion, religio linking, social linking, the social bonds. Um, there's no individuality. So, uh, then in the enlightenment, we get individualism. So, you know, then for post-modernity to come along and people to question individualism again, is it necessarily collective? I don't know. Personally, one of my best friends is a, like, 
uh, postmodernist. I, I would say I am in many ways, but like he's like one of the first people I met who's like, yeah, I'm postmodern. He's not an individualist or collectivist because he basically thinks that both of those concepts are like platonic uh, falsifications of the world. That th these are not like real categories. Any way that you draw a boundary around yourself or group is, is made up. Uh, and personally, I'm inclined to agree with him, right? I think a truly postmodern attitude is not individualistic or collectivistic. And again, so that's another way in which the modern left is not postmodern. Like if you actually believe that there's some sort of like group identification, like identity is a, like a real thing, that's not postmodern. Um, and so I don't know. I just think these like really simple reductive narratives about like the problem is the postmodern left and we have to combat the uh, ideological roots of it. it. It's so silly because I don't think postmodernism is driving the left really at all. And secondly, to the extent that it is still like a relevant um, like intellectual tradition, nobody reads this stuff. Like vote, the vast majority of people who go out and vote or like participate in political movements or care about this stuff um, are not, I mean, you know, the, mo the most politically active people in my country in America, they're boomers. They don't read Marcusa um, and they're not reading far right literature. They don't care about any of that. <laughs> like they really don't. This is like the people who care about political philosophy are weirdos, just like people who care about all philosophy. And, um, you know, I just think it's another grift. It's another con job because the reason why Stephen Hicks goes out and tells people to combat this stuff, we have to familiarize ourselves and study the ideological roots. What is that? That is a form of entertainment for people who are really fixated on this culture war all the time. And so then they think they're like doing something about it, like fighting in the culture war by going and learning, reading Stephen Hicks's book. They're like doing something. And it's like, no, this is just another, it's a more sophisticated form of entertaining yourself um, in the world. And so I guess that's like my, you know, Baudrillard coming out that it's like, it's a simulation of like getting involved. The war of ideas has always been this like, simulacrum of like political activism and personally i'm all for it because some of you people who are really engaged in this culture war stuff y'all are crazy and i want you to keep battling it out in the battle of ideas i don't want you to go out in the street and do any of this stuff um, and realize that what you're doing is completely futile and will not change anything i think it's great that you uh, continue to do things that um have no effect on the world at all because most of the people who are who are super into this um, I don't, I don't want you to be out there affecting the world. <laughs> you're, you're not, <laughs> that's, that's all to the good. And, and that's the other thing too, is like, uh, the video I posted with Devin Gore talking to him, there was a, like a huge, like, uh, it was probably the most unpopular video you know, judging by the comments that I've ever put up and that's fine. It's just. I get the sense that a lot of people, they're not interested in philosophy. They're engaged in a culture war. And philosophy is like a post hoc rationalization or justification for what they already believe and, and want to believe. And they're going and reading things to like reinforce a set of commitments that they already have. And I'm just not interested in that. If, 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 if I've provided you with some, um, some, philosopher that has been helpful to crafting your political case that's great um good i wish you all the best right where whatever part of the political is the same thing machiavelli talks about uh not in in the prince but in his letter where he talks about uh when it's when he's in exile and he goes and every night goes to his room and reads the ancients reads the classics and he talks about how he brings each of these men before his mind. He feels as if he's standing in the academy with Xenophanes or Plato. And he interrogates all of these voices from the past. And uh, Nietzsche and the aphorism Journey to Hades, where he talks about these eight great thinkers who he's locked eyes with and have made their impression on him. Um, you know, I, for me, I just like, I like getting entangled with the mind and 
different set of people from like different times and places di and different perspectives. And it's just fascinating to me. And it's discussion of concepts that are timeless and not involved with this, like just like constant fixation on the immediate moment and the immediate controversy and um, whatever, like, agenda or goal, goal like all these petty the petty politics right <laughs> that Nietzsche talked about so it's unfortunate that I've had to talk about politics to the degree that I have but it's because the more I've like reckoned with the fact that Nietzsche is like a prototypical postmodernist I've realized that just so many of the ideas that just people just say they just repeat them without a second thought then they're just parroting people <sighs> with no understanding of what they're talking about. They're just parroting what they've heard from Stephen Hicks. And what he's saying is just completely wrong. It doesn't map onto the current political situation. He's not accurately describing the psychology of how the other side from him thinks. And it's just useless. And, and then as a result of that, then people don't, they just dismiss things out of hand. Oh, that's a postmodernist drivel. Happens on the left-wing side too. That's just a right-wing talking point. There's so many excuses that people give themselves to just not read <laughs> when really, if they did, you could be, you could be whisked away to a new, um, a, a new vantage point that you might find um, fascinating or invigorating or, or might, you know, uh, be at the very least some entertainment for you. That's not just part of, you know, contemporary with culture, which is frankly, a lot of the time, very superficial. Um, it's way more fulfilling, you know. I mean, how many people deprive themselves of like reading these great works like Faust, or um, you know, the 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 essays of Emerson or Montaigne, because you know uh, they're just fixated on I don't know petty things. Okay, so with that, uh, I will answer some questions from the audience. Uh, and I guess if you have a question, type it into the chat. Um, I know I'm not like really necessarily encouraging people to give super chats by suggesting that I'll just answer any question. <laughs> but you know, if you want to throw me some money, I'll definitely give your question priority. I guess is Popperian intersubjectivity modernist or postmodern? Uh, I would have to refamiliarize myself with what that is. I, I've read the open society and its enemies and I've read about, um, there's a great book called Wittgenstein's poker, which is about Popper's encounter with Wittgenstein. So I know a lot about Popper's life. I actually, the, again, like what's more interesting to me is like Karl Popper as a person than his philosophy. Karl Popper is another one. Like he's kind of become a whipping boy for a lot of the online, right? Because and and uh, and it's not Popper's fault. It's like people propagated as a meme this like comic of Karl Popper, um, you know, basically the paradox of intolerance. And they're using Karl Popper's arguments in this like comic book form to basically talk about why we should censor people. And it's like, okay, that's not going to be popular with anybody. <laughs> so, you know, it's just not. And it may and, and then so then people think it's like, okay, Karl Popper bad. He's the intellectual roots of the people who are out there they're using. And it's just like, um, if you look at Karl Popper's life, um, you know, he grew up in Vienna, Austria as a Jew in a place where he was able, like it was turn of the century. Vienna is one of those places where I would have loved. If I had a time machine, I would love to visit and go to the coffee houses around that time where they're just like some of the most famous intellectuals and they're all like living in the same place. And, um, you know, uh, the coffee house was like you know, sort of like a hipster coffee house today where all the intellectuals hang out and, and argue and, and debate. And Popper kind of comes out of that milieu and then he's forced to flee um, his home when, you know, the after the Anschluss, when the Nazis take over Austria. And so, you know, yeah, naturally his project is like he sees like, OK, society's premised on these values of enlightenment liberalism uh, were like a time of intellectual flourishing and uh, you know, this, this wonderful open society, we must safeguard against anyone coming along ever again to threaten that. And this directly fucked up his life 
<laughs> and so that's why he has a, like a direct experience with that. That's why Carl, Karl Popper is concerned with that project. It's not like he's just like, you know, um, like really wants to censor people. Um, I don't know. I'm probably not doing a good job of selling it. Like if you read that book, Wittgenstein's poker, highly recommended. Uh, you know, I started out, I went into that book probably with a negative opinion of Popper. And I definitely liked Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein's kind of like, you know, he's a badass. He's the guy who would, would, you know, say and do outrageous things and, uh, was super eccentric and, you know, uh, one of the great philosophers, great minds. I actually came out away from that book thinking that Karl Popper was a more admirable figure in many respects than Wittgenstein. Um, okay. Um, let's see here. Somebody says, I saw some people expressed interest in you making an episode on Tolstoy's What is Art? Do you have any plans for this in the future? And what do you think about this essay in general? Tolstoy's What is Art is one of the main influences and a source that I quote heavily from in a book that is that I wrote that is coming out in May. So be on the lookout for that. I made an announcement on the YouTube channel. It's being published by Black Rose Writing, and it's autobiographical and philosophical. Excuse me. Um, I'm probably not going to do an episode on what is art in the foreseeable future for that very reason that my reaction and commentary on Tolstoy's What is Art uh, are like a huge part of that book. Um, but I probably will read the audiobook like myself. So if you want like an audio form discussion on that, it'll be included in that. So um, thank you for asking me a question that allows me to plug my book. Um, Let's see. When are you and your band coming back to New York? Unfortunately, um, I'm not sure. Probably in October, actually. Um, although for that band, this is the newer band, that would be our first time in New York. The old band, which um, we haven't announced it yet, so don't tell anyone. Uh, we may be going on indefinite hiatus this year. Unfortunately for you, our last tour is going to be on the West Coast. So, uh, but the new band, I'm way more excited about, and I think we should be able to make it in October. That's when we're planning a big East Coast tour. I, I can't imagine we wouldn't go to New York. Uh, it will probably be Brooklyn, and it will hopefully be at St. Vitus. Um, let's see here. Do you think Nietzsche had a blind spot when it came to technology? It's hard to know what you mean by that. Uh, like, I guess you could say <sighs> Nietzsche thinks that historical, the movement of history is cyclical and not progressive, but there is technological progress. So is that a form of progressive history? Because technology has progressed. People's lives have, we demonstrably have more technological power over the external world, right? Did Nietzsche have a blind spot regarding that? I don't necessarily think so. I think he understood that there is change over time in our capabilities uh, as a species. Um, I, I just think that, you know, Nietzsche's kind of coming in in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. It's before it's before this period post mainly post World War One and Two, where the rate of technological change just explodes and is wildly accelerated. I mean, it's really hard for us to imagine how slowly technology changed, even during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, in Nietzsche's time, the fastest way to you know get from A to B um, for a lot of people was still by horse. You know, uh, yeah, you can take the train, but like you're still like taking horse-drawn carriage you know, a lot of the places, and you know, you go back 2,000 years, fastest way to get from A to B is by horse. It's still the same. So, you know, even though he Nietzsche's time is sort of like right on the cusp of like, you know, the railroads are being built in America and uh, or have been built, and that's like a very new thing, right? Uh, so I don't know. I mean, did he have a blind spot? Maybe, but I think probably everyone in the 19th century wouldn't have seen the rate of technological change that we experience now, they wouldn't have seen that coming. What do you think wokeism is? Seems to be a lot of thought-stopping cliches around it. What do you think it is? Is it something? 
Is it the new name for anti-SJW progressivism? I mean, that last, what you just said, anti-SJW progressivism. Um, wait, no, that wouldn't be wokeism. That would be anti-wokeism, right? Um, uh, what do I think it is? I think it's, if I had to define it, I mean, notice I didn't use that term at all. I, I, I said like the cultural left. Um, but I mean, I think that is like, there is a constellation of different beliefs that all predict for one another, right? So it's not any one thing, but just like, like what is MAGA, right? Let's look at the other side. Like, you know what MAGA is. I know they don't all literally believe the same things, but they have a series of beliefs where if somebody holds a certain belief about one issue and you know, like a couple of them, you can like, let's say that there's like 10 major issues, cultural issues in America. Typically speaking, you can, if you know like two or three that somebody holds, you can predict the other seven where they're going to stand. Uh, and you will probably not be 100% accurate because there's going to be a lot of variation between individuals, but you'll probably be pretty accurate. And so there's just one side on a debate, a cultural debate, which reflects a certain temperament. And I would say it tends to be an upper class phenomenon. A lot of people don't want to hear that, but uh, you know, it's what the Chinese called baijuo. Um, is is what I think it is. Um, question: Nietzsche, the aristocrat, fantasy, real Nietzsche, anarchist. So let me just kind of ask, like a me Tarzan, you Jane. Uh, I guess you're saying is Nietzsche, is it a fantasy to call Nietzsche an aristocrat? Is the real Nietzsche an anarchist? Uh, I, I find it hard to 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 go with that interpretation personally. I don't think Nietzsche is particularly committed to a political system, though. I really don't. Uh, I think he's he is committed to a set of values that he thinks rejecting those values is necessarily going to be harmful to life. And you could interpret them many ways. I think some interpretations are maybe more honest than others. I also think you shouldn't... Just to make a broader point, don't use some philosopher as permission to abdicate your own authority over what you believe. A lot of people do that where they're like, they're trying to find like, I'll give, oh, here's a good example. And this is, doesn't even concern belief. It concerns behavior. When I used to moderate the Nietzsche subreddit, yeah, I used to be a Reddit mod. So I'm reformed. Um, don't, you know, don't shoot me. But when I was a, a mod on the Nietzsche subreddit, people would be, you know, for lack of a better word, dicks. They'd be trolling. They'd be insulting, uh, just breaking the rules and, and, and being rude to other people. And a common thing they would say if you, like, gave them a suspension or a ban or a reprimand, be like, how, how dare you call yourself a Nietzschean? You know, don't you know Nietzsche was a moral relative? How, how are you imposing your moral rules of etiquette on me? It's like, well, for one... Nietzsche was a painfully polite person who really strongly believed that you should be, you know, sort of humane and 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 maintain etiquette in his own life. In fact, he lists that as one of his four cardinal virtues. We should always be polite. It's one of the things Nietzsche says. But the bigger point is, why are you using Nietzsche as an excuse to be a dick? At the end of the day, who cares? We're running a community here. And if we let everyone act like dicks, the community collapses. Um, and maybe you can be like, well, that's a utilitarian valuation of this. You know, yeah, I'm trying to get something to function. So I am thinking from that angle, right? If you actually want something to work, you kind of have to, to think that way occasionally. So, but, but the, really, again, the point I'm trying to make here, that's just somebody abdicating their own authority saying like, well, I'm acting like a dick because Nietzsche says that it's cool to act like a dick. It's like, no, you're acting like a dick because you want to, <laughs> right? You're getting, you were getting something out of it and then you're using this as a post hoc rationalization for it. And so, um, you know, people who come to the conclusion of like, we should follow this political ideology or that political ideology because Nietzsche on some level, why should anyone care? what Nietzsche thought politically, um, that, which is a serious question. And I, I'm not saying I couldn't make an argument for why you should care. I totally could. But secondly, um, don't abdicate your authority. Like, 
stand by your own um, valuations and your own uh, positions. Uh, don't say this is because what Nietzsche said. Like, come on. That's not a good argument. Okay, uh, what are some more questions? Uh, top list of actions to become Ubermensch. Well, you know, what Zarathustra says, go under. <laughs> you know, uh, live dangerously, build your temples in the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. Is there a such thing as Neo Nietzscheanism? We don't need to invent that term, do we? Really? Do you need to invent, like, add more syllables uh, to Nietzscheanism? Okay. Uh, have you considered doing an episode specifically on Dostoevsky and his influence on Nietzsche? I have. Um, the problem is, if I'm going to do an episode about anything, I have to go, even if I've read it before, and reread the source material. And it's not easy to read Dostoevsky, or it's it's time consuming. So, excuse me. Um, you know, I might. Yes, that's something that I will have to talk about eventually, uh, because I've kind of committed that, like, I'm going to eventually have an episode about basically every single person that Nietzsche mentions when he says, like, you know, he wrote a letter saying, you know, Dostoevsky, look at this guy who was a born psychologist, um, like myself. Uh, he spoke uh, approvingly of Dostoevsky as an influence, and we know uh, that he read The Idiot, and Nietzsche may have read, uh, what was it, The Possessed or Notes from Underground? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, there's one for, for sure read, and then there's a couple other things that we're not sure of. Funnily enough, it seems that, I, I haven't heard anyone make the claim that Nietzsche read Crime and Punishment. It seems that he probably did not, which is the work that people most often uh use as a sort of comparison point between Dostoevsky and Nietzsche. But so uh, what's my point here? So yeah, eventually, yes. But, um, you know, it's it's very time consuming every single topic that I have to cover uh, to do the background research and do the reading. And um, Dostoevsky will probably, that's probably the kind of thing I'll get into maybe next season or later, <laughs> whenever that is. Um, besides Nietzsche, whose content has provided the greatest impact on you. Don't you love that? Every people just call things content now. Uh, I really like Montagna's content. Um, no, it's, I've recently covered Montagna and I think Michelle de Montagna, that's somebody who I really connect with. Um, I, the, just total agnosticism, even agnosticism towards agnosticism itself is how I feel a lot of the time, just total uncertainty and, there's like a a power in embracing that uncertainty. Other than that, um, who's been really in, uh, made a huge impact on me. I mean, in my early days, uh, I was really into Alan Watts. Um, I mean, Watts is great. I still will tell people to listen to Alan Watts. Like he has some great lectures. Um, who else? I mean, the a lot of Greek philosophy as well. Um, I see, I'm, re I'm really into the pre-Socratics, so Nietzsche, his focus on the pre-Socratics naturally sort of connects with me. And then Goethe's Faust, who I've always, already mentioned, um, probably the great, that's probably the greatest impact on my thought, I, I, I guess I would say. How savvy are you at Norse mythology? Um, if Nietzsche liked the Greeks as an example of pre-Christian Europe, might he share some values with Norse paganism and the like? Yeah. Um, funnily enough, Nietzsche doesn't, I would think Nietzsche would have talked more about Norse mythology, and I don't see why he wouldn't have been familiar with it, especially given that Germanic paganism and Norse paganism are so tightly related. I know a fair bit about Norse mythology, actually, um, mainly from uh, reading Neil Gaiman's uh, modernized retelling of Norse uh, myths, uh, and then wanted to look it, that sparked an interest in looking into the background of it because I, I actually never had that much of an interest in norse mythology aside from my scandinavian heritage or in spite of that um because it always seemed like you know okay it's just like a bunch of you know 
long haired dudes like hitting each other with axes and hammers is like it's the life they lived and that's the mythology they told. But a lot of those myths are actually quite clever. And, um, you know, I love the character of Loki. Loki is um, he feels like a somewhat modern character in many of the myths. Um, He's not evil. He's not good. Um, He kind of has an evil. He has a heel turn at the end and, you know, helping to bring on the end of the world. Um, And uh, but, you know, they the 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 rest of the gods really uh, betrayed him, fucked him over. So, you know, he got resentful because he got tied down, you know, uh, tied down with uh, whatever material they used, like uh, some sort of magical silk threads. And then like, you know, poured snake venom in his eyes for all eternity and lo and behold that made loki a resentful vindictive uh jerk who wanted to destroy the world uh weakness corrupts there you go um okay do we have any other questions would you ever have jason reza Giorgiani on my friend steph uh the uber boyo i think had him on i don't know much about him so maybe I'll have to go actually watch that episode. I have to admit, I have not um, not looked into it. Um, somebody asked, what are my thoughts on Pyrrhonism? Strangely enough, whenever I've encountered somebody who self-identifies as a Pyrrhonist, they're usually unlikable people. Um, <laughs> I guess that has nothing to do with the philosophy of Pyrrhonism, but it's made me, it's made me uh, skeptical because, uh, you know, by their fruits ye shall know them to quote some biblical wisdom there um and i think what it is so i just said i like oh i really identify with montagna one of the things i really identify with him or or about montagna though is that his work is not this like demonstration of skepticism he's not like at war with all the truth claims of everyone else trying to tear them down he just doesn't believe them like (laughs) he just doesn't think they actually do have good reason for believing what they believe but as he says like it's putting a high price on our wisdom to burn other people on account of it or you know like when it comes to heretics it's putting a high price on our opinions to burn heretics on account of them um and the thing is whenever i've encountered people who are like i'm a pyrrhonist i really identify with this skeptical philosophy this is how a lot of zenists are as well people's people who are into Zen, particularly the secular Zenists, not necessarily the Zen Buddhists, but the people who are into Zen as like this framework for just rejecting everything and not believing in in any sort of truth claims, which, you know, again, I I started out uh, defending postmodernism. So how can I have a problem with this? Um, Again, it's not, I wouldn't take issue with them on the basis that what they're saying is false. It's just that they're very unpleasant people. Like, uh, they can't ever yes. And (laughs) it's always like, yes, but yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe I do have a streak of the American pragmatists being American myself, uh, that on some level, I don't know what to do with that. Like I go with what works and there are certain, certain principles that you just operate from knowing that they're false. And constantly calling into attention, like, that's just false. That's a narrative. Like, okay, well, like, that's a really, you, you're you denying the fact that you're also creating a, a narrative, that you're living within the skeptical pureness narrative. Um, you know, again, I don't, uh, I don't in principle have anything. Uh, yes, I like pure on. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, it's just, it's more like the modern representatives I find to be insufferable. Um, question, is it just me or moshing is the closest way to embrace our primal fun self without actually getting into trouble? Um, maybe, uh, you know, to, to each his own. I used to like moshing a lot more when I was younger. Uh, and you can st- still get into trouble moshing. Trust me. Will you discuss on truth and lies in a non-moral sense? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, I kind of discuss it in the episode, uh, one of the first episodes of the podcast on truth. Um, it's not exclusively about that essay, but I quote from it, talk about the section that I read from today. So 
yeah, there's some there's some of that. Okay, uh, somebody says, do you like Neil Gaiman as a writer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe he also did the Graveyard Book, which is a very nice. Uh, it's a heartwarming tale about a, uh, a child who grows up in a graveyard and is raised by corpses. And uh, I believe he also wrote he wrote Good Omens with uh, Terry Pratchett, which is a charming, delightful tale. Guzzo Pink, uh, what's up? I know, I know you. Uh, were nation states very different in Nietzsche's time from what they are now? Uh, nowadays, one can't imagine war outside of war between nations. Nietzsche seems to be against nation states, but pro-war. Oh, I, I, okay. Um, I don't think he's necessarily against the nation states, like, e existence. Um, I would say, yeah, the nations back then, that's sort of like the birth of the modern idea of the nation. You could say that kind of comes out of the Napoleonic Wars with the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so does Nietzsche like war but oppose the nation state? I don't think Nietzsche, when he talks about war, it necessarily has to do with anything having to do with like nationalism. Uh, I think it has to do with the fact that he thinks like conflict, force meeting force, is that's actually how... That's how change, transformation, positive or negative, um, that's what lo like is demanded by life and the conditions of life in the world. And that war is happening. You know, some people, you could easily take the other view. It's just a matter of interpretation that you could see the universe. Like you could see a Spinozist universe where everything's in a sort of harmony and that the apparent conflict or contradictions or contradictory forces are actually part of a monistic whole. Nietzsche, his view is that even within things that appear to be harmonious, uh, like within your body, there's a war going on, maybe on the microcellular level, right? So Nietzsche tends to focus on the oppositional and uh, conflict and contradiction, whereas, you know, is that like an absolute truth? No, you could easily take a Spinoza, Spinozistic interpretation of reality, but I think that's how he sees it. And so it, regardless of like whatever form the polity took in his time, uh, I think he would think it was unrealistic to ever have done with war and that there were actually positive and benefits to war or that war could be a creative force. And these are sort of things that we don't, no one seems to think about today. Um, or it's just that opinion is not within the Overton window. Everyone, even the people who are pro-war have to couch their language in terms that are like anti-war. Um, okay, I'm only going to answer like, uh, we'll say three more questions. I often put Nietzsche and Shakespeare on the same level. What are your thoughts on how Nietzsche and Shakespeare relate to each other? Um, Nietzsche had a couple... Nietzsche thinks that Shakespeare, he has high praise for Shakespeare. He he talks about Shakespeare though, like he's a he's a lower class, kind of like uh like a a base born person. He's got a very base soul, and that's why he has all of these insights into the most base desires of mankind. So uh I think he, he makes those remarks in human all too human. Uh Bob <laughs> is squirt just P. Uh yeah, it is. Sorry. Um, let's see here. Any thoughts on Rudolf Steiner? I'm going to admit, I don't know who that is. Um, you asked us recently what our favorite episode is, uh, or what episode we recommend to our friends. What is your favorite episode that you've written? Uh, it's very hard for me to make a judgment on that. It's, it's almost impossible, honestly. Um, cause I don't want to like listen to my own self talking a lot of the time. Um, you know, the, the ones that I'm particularly proud of, like, again, to bring up Faust a third time, I think that turned out pretty well. Um, and I think I'm very proud that I gave that work a, a, a proper exposition to the public. Um, I know I said I was not going to, I was going to answer only three more questions, but, uh, you know, the, the score at one was kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, do you think Nietzsche joined any secret societies or know of such a thing in relation to him? Uh, I do not 
and I don't think he would have been asked um, since he wasn't really that well connected. And I, I don't know. I, a lot of secret societies have like goofy esoteric beliefs, don't they? I, I think Nietzsche would have seen that as like uh, a, a bunch of mumbo jumbo, <laughs> frankly. Um, so yeah, I personally don't think so. Okay, everybody, I've been going for like an hour and a half. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Uh, hopefully there was something of value in this live stream. Hopefully everyone had a good time. Uh, the Pascal episode will be coming out soon. Again, I've got that book coming out as well. Um, you can sign up on Patreon now as a free member and they don't charge you anything. That's just what I'm using as an email list. So if you just want to get updates on that and get emailed when you're able to pre-order the book and all that, uh, please do that. It would massively help me out. Um, and I'll be, yeah, somebody called me on it again. I said it again. Spinoza's coming out soon. Pascal's already out. Uh, the Spinoza episode will be coming out soon. Okay. All right, everybody. Uh, cheers.